Good afternoon now. <laughs> Those of you who watch are watching the live stream, uh, we have a large crowd and um, we wanted to make sure everyone had a chance to, uh, to greet the family. <clears throat> dear friends of Susan Epp, dear members of family, um, both close and distant, we have family from quite a ways here. And of course, all of you who watch by live stream or by recording, um, welcome here. We are gathered here at Reeds to remember, to celebrate, to mourn, and to find comfort uh, in each other's presence and in the presence of God. In many ways, we are participating in a service that Sue prepared for us. She came to this place this past summer to help make those plans. And so I wish all of you peace. I wish um, that the tears that may come um, will be a blessing for you. I invite you to open your hearts uh, to the healing that waits to salve the wounds of grief. We come finally at the end of a long journey for Sue, finally at the passing of our dear sister. I know uh, all of you were alerted in some way to this uh, event. A phone call or a text or an email, Sue had passed. But we have come not um, summoned by dread. We are not uh, inconsolably sad. Death does not have the final word, we believe. And that's why we call this a service of worship. Let us begin that service with prayer. Lord, our God, you are great, you are eternal, and utterly to be trusted. You give life to each of us, and now your spirit of comfort and hope wants to descend upon us. Set our hearts at peace so that we may bring our thanks and our needs before you without fear. We pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You are a singing congregation, I am told. So we will sing. Um, the song, uh, a, a lovely hymn, uh, a favorite now. In the bulb there is a flower. Let me read the, first, the second verse to you. There's a song in every silence seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds, a mystery. Unrevealed until it sees in something God alone can see. The uh, words are on your program. Uh, let's sing together. In our 
death, the resurrection, and the last of victory. Unrevealed until it sees and something God alone can see. One of the most important things in our funerals, the way we practice funeral services, is uh, the life story. And um, this life story was uh, written by uh, sister-in-law Joan Epp. Uh, she has many sources, and I think Sue was one of them. Thank you for doing that for us. Um, and the reading will involve nieces and nephews of Sue. So why don't you come up here, readers, and then come to the podium as it's your turn to read. Susan Ann App arrived on a beautiful spring day in planting season on May 9, 1959, to loving parents Peter and Marie App. Daddy's little girl grew up on the family farm in Blyswood, Ontario, alongside her four younger brothers, Danny, Kenny, Ronnie, and Eddie. She loved these busy boys and cared for them like a mother hen. She became her brother's sounding board, their biggest fan, and their wise elder sister, who delivered sage advice and generous support whenever it was needed. She treasured their company and ship to new, no end. Susie Q, as Doc McLean called her, was the epitome of positivity. Being diagnosed with lupus as a teenager never held her back from achieving her goals. Picking tomatoes or pickles, feeding chickens, doing household chores, and working the counter at the Blyswood Country Store all helped to develop her strong work ethic, but her dreams lay in the field of education. After all, she was herself a model student throughout Blyswood Public School, UMEI, and Leamington High. Apparently, she was also the most fun babysitter in the neighborhood. Who better to shape the hearts and minds of young children? With a BA from the University of Windsor under her belt, Sue attended Lambton College and earned her ECE certificate. She worked at several daycares in Leamington, Blenheim, and Chatham before pursuing her teacher certificate. Sue graduated from the Althouse College at the University of Western Ontario and immediately was hired at C.C. Carruthers in London, Ontario, where she taught SK in grade one. In two years time, she transferred to F.D. Roosevelt Public School, where she taught J.K. to grade two slash three. She was an organizer, a leader, a no-nonsense, exemplary teacher, who engaged her students to learn and pushed them to succeed academically, socially, and emotionally. Miss Epp cared deeply for her students and pushed them, oh sorry, deeply for her students and they really loved her too. She retired in 2017 but continued to volunteer her reading expertise. She also spent countless hours at the London's Children Education Center organizing themed boxes for her classroom teachers. In every school she attended or taught at, Sue made lasting friendships. She relished her time with close friends and colleagues. The road trips across the province, impromptu shopping sprees, concerts, theater events, game nights, and dinner parties were the best. Sue was always the designated driver, of course, not only because her health demanded it, but because she wouldn't have it any other way. She kept her besties safe and sound, and they were equally devoted to her as they created great memories and supported her through her most challenging days. While Sue's professional life provided a deep sense of purpose and a place to make connections, her faith community was a source of strength. Her first church was the North Leamington United Mennonite Church, where she attended Sunday school and was baptized. When she moved to London, Ontario, she joined the congregation of Valley View Mennonite Church. Here she continued to worship with those who shared her devotion and charitable nature. The friends she made here as well as in her close-knit community provided a much loved and support throughout times of celebration and during the darkest days of loss and illness. She was so grateful for those who embraced her. 
Family ties were high on Sue's priority list. Growing up in a myriad of fun-loving cousins was awesome. Visiting the Jansen crew in Beamsville or making the trek out west to celebrate with the Peters clan were highlights for her. She loved her adventures abroad as well as gab local gatherings with the Epp and Peters cousins from Leamington. When COVID hit, she really appreciated the short visits, Saturday, face Saturday FaceTime coffee hours, texts, emails, and calls from her whole extended family. Sue's iPad was the window to her world, so thanks to all who filled her world with loving messages. This brings us back to some final snapshots of life with her immediate family. Combine rads with her dad, preparing holiday festivities with her mom, playful teasing with her brothers, playing ball, hockey, ball in the backyard, Sunday school concerts, highly excitable euchre games after eating a big turkey dinner with apple stellen for dessert, Crocono and Skippo with Dan, birthdays, baptisms, graduations, and family lunches at Colasanti's. What fun we all had together. Sue loved to collect photos of these happy family moments and use them to make memory books for her loved ones. They remind us to cherish, cherish each other in the present and to honor our wonderful past. <clears throat> Sue was an amazing aunt. She organized trips to the Children's Museum, Storybook Gardens, and of course, those highly anticipated weekend summer sleepovers. Her cool London townhouse came with full access to her storybooks, her teddy bear collection, and her undivided attention. There were movies with popcorn and walks along the river and trips to get fast food. Every birthday was acknowledged and every Christmas came with a big bag of homemade chocolatey treats, nuts and bolts, and some of her hard earned cash. Thanks, Aunt Sue. Great Aunt Sue took immense pleasure in spoiling her great grandnieces and grandnephew. She made each new baby a soft crocheted blanket and showered them with so much love. When um, unable to visit, she simply delighted in the photos of her love bugs as they learned to talk, walk, and reach important milestones. Their su successes were her successes. Their joys were her joys. In her final year, Sue bravely battered B-cell lymphoma, low blood levels, frequent infections, and leukemia. Her mom was her strength and stay, constant by her side. Her puzzle mate, her reading buddy, her chef, and her loving caregiver. Today, they soaked in the beauty of river walks and the happy endings. Together, sorry. Of the Hallmark movies, she loved so much. Her mom was the best friend, and she appreciated her more than any of us will know. Susan Annette passed away on November 3rd, 2022, on a sunny afternoon in the fall of her life, in her last season of harvest. She was surrounded by the love of her family, held in the hearts of the dearest friends, amidst the prayers of us all. She knew without a doubt that heaven was the next destination, and she'd be in the company of her brothers and dad, who had gone before her. We will miss her until we meet again. Music was very dear to Sue, and um, both melody and lyrics are one of the best ways of responding to a story like that. And um, Ken and Joan's youngest, uh, Jessica, has agreed to sing for us. Uh, the song is Oceans.
Thank you for that gift. Very powerful. We want to hear from uh, script uh, from the scriptures now. Um, our readers are three women. Uh, there are three cousins. Um, and during this pandemic time, especially when um, Sue got sick now with her health issues, they decided to have a weekly Zoom meeting. The three of them plus Sue. Um, it was on Saturday afternoons at 2 o'clock, standing appointment. Uh, I've never been a part of it, so I don't know what all went on. Uh, no, I, well, I do have an idea. But um, those three cousins are Ann Reimer, Linda Thiessen-Belch, and Deb Froze. Um, what a, a blessed uh, gift to have here at the, uh, near the end of Sue's life. And they will come forward and read scripture for us. Um, Psalm 121 was Sue's choice, and that will be read. And then I chose two passages from Romans 8. Come on up, please. I texted Psalm 121 to Sue a num on a number of occasions, and she indicated to me that it was one of her favorite psalms. And it was also a psalm that she demonstrated in her life. Her faith and her trust in God was evident and real in, um, in the midst of tough questions, in an unknown future, and in the midst of uh, sadness and loss. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forever. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This is, <coughs> excuse me, this is also from Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor the powers, neither the height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ah, we sing again, uh, this time uh, a hymn chosen uh, by the family, Going Home. The tune is uh, Dorjak, uh, I think from his Ninth Symphony, um, New World Symphony, Going Home. Again, the words are um, right there. Do you want to stand or are you better sitting? Sitting. We, we remain sitting.
Dear Aunt Marie, dear family, apt family, and extended relatives both near and far. Also, dear members of her church, Valley View Mennonite Church, who are here today as well. So we're here to celebrate and to remember, but we're also here to grieve and hurt as we remember Susan Epp now gone from among us. Even those of us who live far from London's, uh, Sue's London home, often kept an eye out or an ear out for how she was doing over the years. You know, I did. But her health struggles, how she bravely and optimistically kept that fight for health going. Sometimes there was hard news difficult health news. And then we would hear about some accommodations that she had made and some hope expressed about how this difficulty could now be overcome. And on the occasions when we met her or talked with her, unfailingly, what we heard from her was measured optimism in the face of hard medical news. Like it is for all of us, she was fully aware that life is lived within the shadow of death. Hers too. But life was worth living for Sue, and she gave it her all. In a life story you heard mention about her steely determination as obstacles kept coming back, health obstacles. They were a part of her life, especially in the last few years, but they never defined her. Her long, successful teaching career was successful, exemplary, and her life was rich and full by any measure. Today, in a few minutes, I thought I might try to begin to understand what made this exceptional woman tick. How could she live with such grace while the shadow of death circled and loomed nearby? Well, to start, she was a member of the Epp family, a dynamic, active, maybe rambunctious family. Is that fair, Ed? Yeah. After all, they were the children of Peter Epp. At least that was my impression. Uh, last week, I gathered with the family. We looked through some family albums. That was fun. But as I remember your family life, I am also reminded that you are a family that is acquainted with grief. And you know the deep griefs I speak about. Ken's tragic accident, Dan's long struggles with epilepsy. You all, including Sue, have been a family that has borne much. You are acquainted with grief. Now, I use an expression coined by the ancient prophet Isaiah, an understatement if I ever heard one. I said you were acquainted and hurt by grief, but you are not defined or limited by it. We saw that in Sue Epp. She was a practicing Christian believer. Of that we have lots of evidence. She was by nature an optimistic, happy person, despite finding, fighting health by, battles for almost all of her life, um, diagnosed with lupus as a teenager.
but she carried this grief with you. How did she manage this for 63 years of life? For answers, I want to look at these three passages that were read for us just now. These scriptures come go to the heart of faith, Christian faith. First, Psalm 121. I can see why it was a favorite. It has inspired generations of believers. The imagery of soaring mountains and the creator who is mirrored in these lofty peaks. And the psalmist is confident, quietly confident, God will not let your foot slip. And you get the sense that the writer is on a journey through these mountains. Mountain passes are dangerous places. High cliffs, rocky outcroppings. And it's a bit ironic that the psalmist looks to the mountains for help because that's precisely where the danger also lies. That's where the robbers would hang out waiting for the victims below. That's where the rock falls would come from. That's where the wild animals would hide. That's where danger lurked in the mountains. But the psalmist is filled with assurance that these great natural monuments, these mountains pointed towards a God, a creator that is the giver of life, the God who has a special relationship with humans who in turn understand and long for that God. In fact, the last stanza uh, of that poem, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forever. What a statement of faith and trust. It's not that the Psalms don't have other realities too. In Psalm 103, we read, God knows that we are dust. We live our three score and ten, and then we are dust. We're gone. The wind blows over it, and we are gone. Our lives are short. Our lives are troubled by enemies, by health issues, by troubles of our own making and apparent bad luck. But the psalmist boldly states he has full faith that finally our essence is not harmed. We will be watched over both now and evermore. I think Sue lived this faith out. She believed this. I'm told her attitude was this to the problems in life. There is a solution in every problem, and I've got to work puzzling it out. I understand she loved puzzling. But of course, have you ever had a puzzle where there are pieces missing? <laughs> you find out at the end where the pieces are broken. But she had that faith. A puzzle does have a solution. And she faced the headwinds of life squarely. As each complication presented itself, she did her very best. And this faith sustained her until the end. The Romans passage. And we know that all things, uh, we, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. While this is a passage that has often been misused or cheapened, or misread. Everything will be hunky-dory if you have enough faith, some people would say. If you're having trouble, maybe you don't have enough faith. This kind of interpretation is a blow to those of us who stumble along in life, who experience the problems of life in multiples. So what do we make of illness and tragedy then? 
Does this in verse imply that God is not working for the good of those people who stumble? What of someone who gets lupus in her teenage years, for example? No, no. I think this passage does the opposite. It reinforces the testimony of the psalmist. The Lord will watch over your coming and going now and forevermore. So how did this play out in Sue's life? Did that lupus dig diagnosis sour her on life? No. First of all, we remember Sue's overflowing heart of love. Lots of evidence here, these nieces and nephews who just read for us. I would love to interview them. What was Aunt Sue like when you were a kid? You were her joy. But of course, it wasn't just children in her own family. She spent over 30 years, or about 30 years, teaching little ones at elementary, at the beginning of their lives as students. My wife, Marilyn, is a grade one teacher, and although I spent 30 years teaching high school students, that's nothing compared to the work that happens in grade one. I have great admiration for people like Sue who take these little ones crying, leaving their mothers for the first time. If they're lucky enough to have a mother, she did work in London after all. And teach them. One of the things elementary school teachers have told me is often those little ones accidentally call their teachers mommy. <laughs> um, what um, what um, a title to give to a woman teaching children um, for the first time. I'll mention my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. McClure. She was my teacher. I uh, fondly, fondly remember her. And I expect she had love returned to her often. I suggest to you that she had love to give because she felt loved and valued by a God she trusted to make it good. And at the core, I think that is what made Sue tick. Of course, love given away always returns. Sue had many good friends. Some of you are watching from afar, relatives, friends. Uh, I know in London, she had a faith community at Valley View Mennonite, a congregation that stood with her. I know there are members here today, um, right to the end. I, I know David and Gloria particularly reached out to support her. And I've heard many stories about a neighbor where Sue lived, someone who offered his car, is time to take her to appointments. The name I have, Jim and Brenda, I hope that's right. Um, love returned. Such love touches us all deeply. And Sue's love had its origins in the love of God for her. Sue was truly a child of God. But she was also the child of her mother, Marie. Another gift of God. Marie, someday a pastor will write a meditation reflecting on your faith and your life. And that's as it should be. But I need to say something about you in this sermon too. I said earlier that yours is a family that is acquainted with grief. You've carried much in your life. And now once again, you are called to carry more. You willingly moved to London to help Sue in this hard time. I know Sue was deeply grateful and so are we all. We Mennonites don't deify our saints. We don't pray to them. 
but in your graciousness, Marie, in your generosity of spirit, in your unfailing optimism, you inspire us all. I know your faith in God has carried you too, but your faith helps us carry our lives too. Thank you for the way you and Sue carried this burden together. You've inspired us. And so Romans 8, boy, it's Paul's best stuff if you read all of his letters. This is the high point. Ends it with this. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, heights, or depths, or anything else, in all of creation will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The passage lifts us up. And you'll hear that again shortly. Uh, Maddie's going to sing for us that, that song. And keep this text in mind as she sings. Love will never let us go, Paul cries. God will never let us go. And so when Sue asked the doctors to give up the experimental treatment last week, she was not giving up. She was not throwing in the towel. She was giving herself to the God who has assured her that he would take this tired and worn body and bring her home. Now nothing could separate her from the love of God and nothing could separate her from the love of Jesus, her Lord. For this faith in Sue's life, we give thanks. For this hope, we give thanks. But it's not only the Epp family that's acquainted with grief. So are we all in some way. Each one of us carries the marks of life, of tragedy within us. I wish faith enough for each of you to bear your burdens with hope and joy and faith. Sue, thank you for showing us a way to live life with faith. Thank you. I invite Maddie Ham forward to uh, sing for us, friend of the family. Sorry. 
shoulders you raise me up to more than i can be you raise me up to Thank you very much, Maddie. That's beautiful. Our service draws to a close. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, the interring of um, Sue's ashes will be in the context of a small family gathering at a later time. And then um, the family is overwhelmed by the support they have felt from you. How many of you have come? They are slightly surprised. Um, there is a meal uh, that is prepared in, in the southwest corner of this building. We're about 130 or so here. It's set for 100. <laughs> I will say no more than that. Okay. Let us pray. Uh, and then we are dismissed. God, we come to offer you thanks for what you have done for us through Jesus Christ. By giving Jesus to live and die for us, you have disclosed your gracious plan for the world and shown that your love has no limits. By raising Christ from the dead, you have promised that those who trust in him will share his resurrection life. For the assurance and hope of our faith and for all those who have you, that you have received already into your eternal joy, we say thanks. We lift up our hearts in gratitude for the life of Sue F now gone from among us, for all your goodness to her through many years, for all that she was to those who loved her, and for everything in her life that reflected your goodness. We give thanks for her faith through many seasons. We give thanks for those who supported her we give thanks for those who prayed for her and with her. God, you teach us always, and in this life you have, te you have taught us too what it means to follow you. Surround us and all who are mourning today with your unending compassion. Don't let grief overwhelm us or be unending, or turn us against you. And then we ask, guide us on the, on the course of our own journeys. Help us to live that we might not be ashamed when we meet you on the last day. Bring us in the company of all the redeemed to your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ. And now, Sue F., may God bless you and keep you. May the very face of God shine on you and be gracious to you. May God's presence embrace you and all of us and give us peace. Amen. Go in peace.